tonight. I'll be showing you where the magic happens in DaVinci Resolve's Fusion page. Maybe you're going along editing a video and you want to make a little graphic that comes up that reminds your viewers to subscribe to your channel. Or maybe you want a cool transition to move you to the next scene. In this video, you'll learn how to create and combine awesome effects, how to animate those effects, and if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna show you my secret weapon on the edit page that doubles the Fusion page's possibilities. This is Crash Course Resolve. Let's dive in. Let's make the Fusion page easy. On the edit page, come up to the Effects tab and go to Effects, where you will see Fusion Composition, which you can just drag into the timeline. Click on over to the Fusion page, and we will be working on the Fusion Composition now. In Fusion, instead of a timeline, we have this like nodes grid. By default, the only thing we're going to have here is a media out node. You can think of this as the final node in whatever we do. Just know that it's what sends your effect to the timeline to be rendered out for your video. So let's give it something to render. If you look here, there's actually a bunch of different basic tools that you can use to get started in Fusion. These are actually only a fraction of the effects you have available to you, but even still, there are way too many here to go over in just one video. So we're gonna just pick a couple really basic ones to get you started. Let's start with the background node. This works pretty similar to a solid color node on the edit page in that it's pretty much just a single solid color. When I drag it into the node space, it doesn't actually do anything until I preview it. So if I hover over it and click this left dot here, it will appear in our left preview viewer here. It's pretty much just a black box right now. And since we are in a 1080p project, it's a 1080p box. When I click on it or highlight it, it automatically comes up here in the inspector, just like on the edit page. So we can take these settings and start doing things like changing the color. But you'll see, even though I have a blue box here, if I click on over to the edit page, there's still nothing here. This is because even though we have a background node and a media out node, these aren't actually connected or like communicating in any way. This background node is basically just existing in the ether somewhere. In order to actually get what we're creating in Fusion out to the edit page, we actually have to pipe the background node to the media out node. And you'll see since the preview has the media out in the right viewer, the blue box came up in our right viewer. And if we click on the edit page, now we have the blue box available to us on the edit page. The node system can be pretty intimidating and confusing at first to people who are more used to layers-based systems you see in other compositing softwares like After Effects or really in any editing software like the edit page in Resolve. But once I help you to understand what's going on with these nodes and you really get a hang of it, you're gonna see just how powerful the system is and why it's so much easier to work with than layers. This blue background is cool and all, but I want some text. so let's go ahead and grab the text plus tool from right here and throw it in our left preview. And for now, I'll go ahead and drag it to our media out. With our text node selected, let's go over to the inspector and type in get to the chopper. I really don't need both previews open since I'm previewing the text and the media out. So if I come up here and click this viewer icon, it will condensed to just one viewer. The gray checkerboard underneath the text just indicates that what's underneath the text is transparent. This just means if you come to the edit tab and now put any media underneath the fusion composition, that the text is going to sit on top of it. So we have the text here and we have the background, but we can't pipe them both into the media out at the same time. We can only do one or the other. Does this mean we have to have two different fusion compositions if we wanna have text on top of the background? Of course not. In place of layers, we have what's called a merge node. A merge node is kind of an intermediary node between whatever nodes you wanna combine and the media out node. This kind of lets you tap into the power of layers. So the merge node has a lot of arrows pointing into it. So let's take a look. If you hover your mouse over a given input, it will actually tell you what the input is. So you can see the green arrow is the foreground, the yellow arrow is the background, and the blue arrow is the effect mask, which we'll go over later. So let's take our backgrounds output and put it in the background input of the merge. And let's take our text output and put it in the foreground input of the merge. And then let's take the output of the merge and connect it to our media out. And suddenly our text is layered on top of the blue background. And now the merge node actually has its own settings. So by default, you can change how the foreground sits relative to the background. If ever you've mucked up some settings and you want to get back to the defaults, you can actually always just double click on whatever setting you've changed and it will set it back to its default setting. The second group of nodes here, I like to call the effect nodes. These are the nodes that actually kind of change something about what you've already got. So for example, let's take this blur node. Just like with the other nodes, this effect node has to be piped in for it to affect anything. I want it to blur my text. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm gonna take my text node and move it up to give me some space. I'm gonna disconnect the text node from the merge node. I'm gonna put my blur node between the two, and now I'm gonna pipe the output of the text to the input of the blur, and the output of the blur to the input of the merge. You don't see any changes immediately, but now if we click on blur and we change our blur size, our text starts to blur and it doesn't affect the background. The blur only affects what's piped into it. If, for example, we wanted it to affect the text and the background at the same time, we could actually disconnect it, reconnect the text back to the merge, disconnect the merge from the media out, connect that into the input of the blur, and now to have the blur go into the media out. Now, it isn't immediately obvious that the blur has been applied to our background because our background takes up the entire image. So let's see if we can take our background node and make it smaller so that we can see that it's blurred. I'm gonna take my background node and drag it to the left here. And then while it's highlighted, I'm gonna come up here and click on the transform node. When you have a node selected and you click on another node, it will actually put that node automatically in the pipeline between the node you had selected and whatever that node was going to. Now that our transform sits between our background and our merge, we can actually take the size here and start dragging it down and our background becomes smaller. And since the background is what is piped into the transform, the only thing that gets affected is the background node. Generally, the pipeline moves from left to right and top to bottom. So now you can think of our whole system as being, there's a blue square that gets shrunk and then has a text merged on top of it and then both are blurred and then they go to the timeline. So let's say you decide you want a third element. Let's grab our text plus and type in, who is your daddy? And what does he do? Since we haven't piped it in anywhere, it doesn't show up in our immediate out. But Noah, you say, the merge node only has two inputs. What do we do? Well, of course, we're gonna give us some space between this media out and the blur. And while the blur is highlighted, I'm gonna click on another merge node. Everything before this pipe that goes into the background of the merge node becomes the background of the merge node. Everything that's been merged in with this merge has become just one little compressed layer that goes into the background of the merge two. This merge one node has taken our text and our background and has fused them together. It's why it's called fusion. At least I, I, I think it's why it's called fusion. I, I actually don't really know why it's called fusion. Just like in Yu-Gi-Oh, once you've used polymerization, you can use another one to take that new fusion and make it into a newer fusion. So let's take our text and put it into the foreground of this merge two node. You couldn't tell. I've been playing a lot of Master Duel lately. Of course, by default, our text is now kind of like overlaying on top of each other. We could add another transform node after the text, but like I said earlier, in the merge node, you can actually change things like the position of the foreground. Now, the last type of node we're gonna talk about today is a mask node. Technically, just about any node can be used as a mask, but we're gonna start today with using just the basic shapes. Let's grab this rectangle node and drag it behind our background node here. You'll see while I have the rectangle selected, it actually draws a preview of the rectangle into the viewer, and I can actually edit the rectangle straight from the viewer just by grabbing the edges here and dragging them along. You can also change the position and the rotation, and of course, those can all be changed here in the inspector as well. So let's see what happens when we take the output of the rectangle and we drag it into the mask input of the background. You'll see it actually conforms the background node to the shape of the mask. And of course, if we change where the mask is, it will change what section of the background is getting masked. But you'll see when I drag the rectangle over to the left that you still see the edge of the rectangle here. That's because the mask doesn't actually change the size or position or anything of the node that it's being input to. It only changes what is visible. So if we actually make this mask as tall and as wide as the background node, you'll see it doesn't actually change anything. But as we drag it back and forth, you'll see it will mask and reveal the node that it's masking. You're not restricted to just masking generators, you can also mask effects. Let's take our ellipse node here and drag it above the blur and then take the output of the ellipse and put it in the mask input of the blur. And you'll see if we zoom in, Inside the circle, the background is being blurred and outside the circle, it isn't. With the ellipse selected, you can do things like create a soft edge so it gradually blurs what's inside the circle. You can also invert it so that everything outside the circle is being blurred and what's inside the circle isn't. If you've been following along so far and you've got all this down pat, congratulations, you've just overcome the most challenging concepts to understand in Fusion. But there's one last basic thing you need to understand and that's animating your fusion projects. I'm gonna show you how to create a very basic wipe animation. Make sure on this little frame count here that the little playhead is on the first frame or the zero if frame, whatever. You can also come to this little box here and type zero. Now make sure your rectangle is highlighted, take the center option and move it off the screen so that your rectangle is invisible. Now what we're gonna do is tell fusion to animate this element. 
So next to the center icon here is this little keyframe icon just click it. Now let's move one second into the animation. So you can either click the 30th frame here or you can type 30 into this box. And then all we have to do is move the center X back to where the box is visible. And now as if by magic, if we go back to the zeroth frame and click play, the box will slide onto the screen and reveal our box. By default, the animation's a little static. It's kind of plain. It's got what's called a linear curve for the motion. Generally, we're gonna want our animated elements to be a little bit more dynamic. For this, we're gonna mess with splines. Normally you'd see splines up here in like the top right and the little window would come up here in like the bottom right. So I'm just gonna come up here to workspace and change my secondary display to my main monitor so that you guys can see what the spline is doing. Now in the spline, you can see the only thing we've animated so far is that rectangle. So it's the only option for us to check. If we check the rectangle box, the displacement becomes visible in the spline editor. What I'm gonna do is click this little zoom to fit button Button. That's gonna show me kind of the length of the animation rather than the length of the fusion composition. And then down here, I'm gonna select all, and that's gonna select both of the points, the beginning and end point of the animation. And then from there, you can actually just grab these handles and edit the spline yourself, or you can hit this little curve button and it will automatically create curved splines here. These are pretty gentle curves. Generally, we see curves that are a little bit more extreme. So what we can do is we can grab the handles here and we can actually lengthen them out. Best way to do that is to click on the handle then press Alt, then start dragging to the right, and then stop when the handle is lined up with the end of the animation. Then we're gonna take this handle and do the same thing. Click, hold Alt, and then start dragging to the left. You'll see this one actually won't let us go past the beginning of the animation. And then booyah, you're an animation genius. You've got a super slick little cool transition that reveals a box. It may not seem like much, but you really do now have basically all of the knowledge you need to make a good 90% of all of the animations and effects you could ever want to make in Resolve. If you made it this far in the video, thanks for sticking around. I told you if you made it to the end, I would show you my secret weapon for taking fusion projects in the edit page to the next level. I feel like I say to the next level in like every video, but whatever. Well, here's the idea. We're gonna combine fusion effects with adjustment clips. I was actually gonna cover adjustment clips in my last video, but I ran out of space on my SD card for my camera. I've gone over them in a couple of my videos, but in case you need a refresher, here's how they work. Basically, if I have multiple pieces of media, or as you might say, multiple layers in my timeline, sometimes I want to apply an effect to both of them at the same time. For example, if I come over here to effects and I go over to open effects and add a blur, I'm sorry, the zoom blur is just perfect for this footage. You can see I can only add it either to our text effect here, or I can add it to the footage underneath. I can't add it to both. So if we click on the effects tab, and then we grab an adjustment clip and we put it over both of our layers here and slide it so it takes up the whole time. And now we add our blur to the adjustment clip. It will blur everything underneath the adjustment clip. It will blur every layer. By default, clicking over to the Fusion tab opens whatever's topmost in your timeline in the Fusion tab, but you can actually open whatever layer you want by clicking on it, right clicking, and clicking open in Fusion page. And if we do this with footage, we actually get a media in node. And if we do this, we can actually do things like add effects to media rather than having to generate something that we're applying our effects to. What's cool about that is that we can actually do this with adjustment clips. So with this adjustment clip, I could use the zoom tool to zoom in and out of all of the footage underneath the adjustment clip. Or with the adjustment clip highlighted, I can click on over to the Fusion tab. And now our media in becomes everything underneath the adjustment clip. And you can add fusion effects to everything that the adjustment clip affects. So for example, if I add the transform tool now, I can use this to use a little bit more precision with my zoom in and out. And also I can animate it with the spline of the fusion page, which isn't available on the edit page. And the best part is this has now become a portable effect. If I click on our adjustment clip and go to file, and rename it to zoom out. I can now hold alt and click and create a duplicate of that zoom. And you'll see it, it'll only be applied when the adjustment clip is on top of the timeline. We can even go over to our media pool and add the zoom out clip to the media pool. And now we can just grab it and drag it wherever we want. We can even apply them on top of each other. And then you can add it to a power bin. And now you can use that zoom out effect in any 
project you want. This is how I made this cool little zoom effect that I've been using in my videos lately. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Resolve. I hope it wasn't information overload. If you want to learn more about the Fusion page and what it's capable of, I have this video here about a webcam border I created for live streams that's based off of the one Shroud uses and it goes into a lot of really cool things that you can do in the Fusion page that I didn't cover in this video. So if you're looking to get a little bit of experience under your belt with something very easy, go watch that video.